Good morning, class. Today we have lit speed building from 170 to 190. So let me give you some words that come out on your speed building. You have Alabama, Gregory Gold, Raymond Lee, Pickens County, Mrs. Caldwell, Sheriff, Gold's parents, probation, Judge McClan, Alabama School for Delinquent Children, Miranda Warning, The Court, Sean Willows, New Jersey, U.S. Supreme Court, Willows Case, Supreme Court, okay? And so, and probation officer. Probation officer is Proffer, P-R-A-U-F-R, Proffer. You've got, um, what else? You have, Supreme Court is Sport, S-P-R-O-U-R-T. Put the asterisk in if you want it capped. Uh, Miranda Warning is M-R-N-G, initial M-R, final N-G. Okay, and this is going to be 170 for five minutes. <clears throat> it's called Juvenile Court Review. Your Honor, I have two cases I would like to cite for the record. On June 18, 2009, a 15-year-old Alabama boy named Gregory Gold and his friend Raymond Lee were taken into custody by the Pickens County Sheriff on a complaint from a Mrs. Caldwell that they had made by the Pickens County Sheriff on a obscene phone call to her. They were taken immediately to the local detention facility. Gold's parents were at work and were not informed of his arrest or his detention. Gold was on probation at the time and his probation officer arranged for a delinquency hearing on the following day. His parents were not advised of the hearing until that morning. <clears throat> Neither Gold or his parents were informed on the specific charges filed against him. They were not advised of any constitutional rights. The so-called victim, Mrs. Caldwell, did not appear in court to give evidence. The probation officer provided hearsay information to the judge as to what she alleged Gold had said. The petition was filed by the probation officer at the hearing, but it did not cite the specific allegation. The wording stated that said minor is under the age of 18 years as in, and is in need of protection by the court. Said minor is a delinquent. The case was continued for a week to allow time for a report from the probation officer. Gold's mother requested that Mrs. Caldwell come to court and identify who made the phone calls, but the judge said her presence was not necessary. On June 25, Judge McClan found Gregory Gold delinquent for making lewd phone calls and committed him to the Alabama School for Delinquent Children. He was to remain there until his 21st birthday or until paroled. If he had been convicted as an adult, Gold could have been fined a maximum of $500 or jailed for 60 days. Instead, he was deprived of his freedom for up to six years without any due process for making three phone calls to Mrs. Caldwell, in which he said, are your cherries ripe? Are you giving any away today? Do you have big bombers? An attorney was retained to appeal the case, but he was frustrated to find that Alabama law did not provide for appellate review of juvenile cases. Finally, after considerable legal effort, the case was accepted on a writ of certiorari by the U.S. Supreme Court. In May of 2011, the court reversed Gold's conviction and mandated that the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination and most of the Sixth Amendment might be applied to any juvenile court hearing in which the consequences could be the loss of individual freedom. The Gold decision extended the Miranda warning to juvenile proceedings, Your Honor, beginning with police contact. If the case was going to court, the minor was guaranteed the right of notice of charges, the right to an attorney, the right to cross-examine witnesses, the right to present witnesses, and the right to protection against self-incrimination. The only Sixth Amendment rights not given to juveniles were a public trial and a jury trial by one's peers. The Supreme Court justices hoped that by their decision, juveniles would receive the best of both worlds, that the Constitution protects adults and provides protection of a juvenile in court. The other case, Your Honor, is the Sean Willows case. Sean Willows was a 12-year-old boy from New Jersey who was taken into police custody for breaking into a locker and stealing $220 from a woman's purse. The juvenile court proceedings were initiated on his behalf. 
he was adjudicated a delinquent and he was committed to a reform school for 18 months with the provision that the commitment could be extended until Willow's 18th birthday. The New Jersey juvenile court proceedings were civil, not criminal. Consequently, the standard of proof used in civil cases also applied. This standard is the preponderance of the evidence, which means a probability of guilt, not a certainty. In Willow's case, the judge acknowledged that he had some doubts as to his guilt. Nevertheless, he probably did the act and was deprived of his freedom for what could amount to six years. The standard of proof required in criminal cases has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt since 1798. In the Willows case, the U.S. Supreme Court wanted to preserve the civil and protective nature of juvenile court, but it also wanted to uphold a basic principle of American law, and that is innocent until proven guilty. The court held that the due process clause of the law, and that is innocent until proven guilty, the court held that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment protects the accused against conviction except upon proof beyond a reasonable doubt of every fact necessary to constitute the crime with which he is charged. The Supreme Court mandated that the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt shall apply in any ju juvenile proceeding in which it is alleged that a juvenile committed an act that would be a crime if committed by an adult. Your Honor, both cases make equally clear that juveniles must be given due and so um, juvenile court, you all, is J, let me write this down, J Longview or J Jort, J-O-U-R-T, Jort, J for juvenile court, Ort. You have um, New Jersey is Nuge and Longview, J, New Jersey. You have um Self-incrimination is just S-E-F-L, incrimination, three strokes. You have at the very beginning where they're saying um, sight, huh. K-R long I-T, okay? That's the site. For the record, F-R-O-R-D. And this is going to be at 180. Your Honor, I have two cases I would like to cite for the record. On June 18, 2009, a 15-year-old Alabama boy named Gregory Gould and his friend Raymond Lee were taken into custody by the Pickens County Sheriff on a complaint from a Mrs. Caldwell that they had made obscene phone calls to her. They were taken immediately to the local detention facility. Gold's parents were at work and were not informed of his arrest or his detention. Gold was on probation at the time and his probation officer arranged for a delinquency hearing for the following day. His parents were not advised of the hearing until that morning. Neither Gold or his parents were informed on the specific charges filed against him. They were not advised of any constitutional rights. The so-called victim, Mrs. Caldwell, did not appear in court to give evidence. The probation officer provided hearsay information to the judge as to what she alleged Gold had said. The petition was filed by the probation officer at the hearing, but it did not cite the specific allegation. The wording stated that said minor is under age, 18 years of age, and is in need of protection by the court. Said minor is a delinquent. The case was continued for a week to allow time for a report from the probation officer. Gold's mother requested that Mrs. Caldwell come to court and identify who had made the phone calls, but the judge said her presence was not necessary. On June 25, Judge McClann found Gregory Gold delinquent for making lewd phone calls and committed him to the Alabama School for Delinquent Children. He was to remain there until his 21st birthday or until parole. If he had been convicted as an adult, Gold could have been fined a maximum of $500 or jailed for 60 days. Instead, he was deprived of his freedom for up to six years without any due process for making three phone calls to Mrs. Caldwell in which he said, are your cherries ripe? Are you giving any away today? Do you have big bombers? And an attorney was retained to appeal the case, but he was frustrated to find that Alabama law did not provide for appellate review of juvenile cases. Finally, after considerable legal effort, the case was accepted on a writ of certiorari by the U.S. Supreme Court. On May of 2011, the court reversed Gold's conviction and mandated that the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination and most of 
the Sixth Amendment be applied to any juvenile court hearing in which the consequences could be the loss of individual freedom. The Gold decision extended the Miranda warning to juvenile proceedings, Your Honor, beginning with police contact. If the case was going to court, the minor was guaranteed the right to notice of the charges, the right to an attorney, the right to cross-examine witnesses, the right to present witnesses, and the right to the protection against self-incrimination. The only Sixth Amendment rights not given to juveniles were a public trial and a jury trial by one's peers. The Supreme Court justices hoped that by their decision, juveniles would receive the best of both worlds that the Constitution protects adults and provides protection of a juvenile in court. The other case, Your Honor, is the Sean Willows case. Sean Willows was a 12-year-old boy from New Jersey who was taken into police custody for breaking into a locker and stealing $220 from a woman's purse. Juvenile court proceedings were initiated on his behalf. He was adjudicated a delinquent and he was committed to a reform school for 18 months with the provision that the commitment could be extended until Willow's 18th birthday. The New Jersey juvenile court proceedings were civil, not criminal. Consequently, the standard of proof used in civil cases also applied. This standard is the preponderance of the evidence, which means a probability of guilt, not a certainty. In Willow's case, the judge acknowledged that he had some doubts as to his guilt. Nevertheless, he probably did the act and was deprived of his freedom for what could amount to six years. The standard of proof required in criminal cases has been proof beyond a reasonable doubt since 1798. In the Willows case, the US Supreme Court wanted to preserve the civil and protective nature of juvenile court, but it also wanted to uphold a basic principle of American law, and that is innocent until proven guilty. The court held that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment protects the accused against conviction, except upon proof beyond a reasonable doubt of every fact necessary to constitute the crime with which he is charged. The Supreme Court mandated that the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt shall apply in any juvenile proceeding in which it is alleged that a juvenile committed an act that would be a crime if committed by an adult. Your Honor, both cases make equally clear that juveniles must be given due process. These are copies of case citations for reference, Your Honor. And so trial court, you all, is TROURT, T-R-O-U-R-T, trial court. And then let me give you um, another one. You've got um, juvenile by itself. This is one way of writing it. J Lung U V L. Yeah, I think that's the easiest, J Lung U V L. And then you've got, um, there was one more I wanted to give you. Constitutional rights, if you can remember it, is T Lung U R T S. Okay. And this is going to be at 190. Your Honor, I have two cases I would like to cite for the record. On June 18, 2009, a 15-year-old Alabama boy named Gregory Gold and his friend Raymond Lee were taken into custody by the Pickens County Sheriff on a complaint from a Mrs. Caldwell that they had made obscene phone calls to her. They were taken immediately to the local detention facility. Gold's parents were at work and were not informed of his arrest or his detention. Gold was on probation at the time and his probation officer met, arranged for a delinquency hearing the following day. His parents were not advised of the hearing until that morning. Neither Gold or his parents were informed on the specific charges filed against him. They were not advised um, of any constitutional rights. The so-called victim, Mrs. Caldwell, did not appear in court to give evidence. The probation officer provided hearsay information to the judge as to what she alleged Gold had said. The petition was filed by the probation officer at the hearing, but it did not cite the specific allegation. The wording stated that said minor is under age of 18 years and is in need of protection by the court. Said minor is a delinquent. The case was continued for a week to allow time for a report from the probation officer. Gold's mother requested that Mrs. Caldwell come to court and identify who had made the phone calls, but the judge said her presence was not necessary. On June 25, Judge McClann found Gregory Gold delinquent for making nude phone calls and committed him to the Alabama School for Delinquent Children. He was to remain there until his 21st birthday or until parole. If he had been convicted as an adult, Gold could have been fined a maximum of $500 or jailed for 60 days. Instead, he was deprived of his freedom for up to six years without any due process for making free phone calls to Mrs. Caldwell in which he said, are your cherries ripe? Are you giving any away today? 
do you have big bombers? An attorney was retained to appeal the case, but he was frustrated to find that Alabama law did not provide for appellate review of juvenile cases. Finally, after considerable legal effort, the case was accepted on a writ of certiorari by the U.S. Supreme Court. In May of 2011, the court reversed Gold's conviction and mandated that the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination and most of the Sixth Amendment be applied to any juvenile court hearing in which the consequences could be the loss of individual freedom. The Gold decision extended the Miranda warning to juvenile proceedings, Your Honor, beginning with police contact. If the case was going to court, the minor was guaranteed the right to notice of the charges, the right to an attorney, the right to cross-examine witnesses, the right to present evidence, and the right to the protection against self-incrimination. The only Sixth Amendment rights not given to juveniles were a public trial and a jury trial by one's peers. The Supreme Court justices hoped that by their decision, juveniles would receive the best of both worlds, that the Constitution protects adults and provides protection of a juvenile in court. The other case, Your Honor, is the Sean Willows case. Sean Willows was a 12-year-old boy from New Jersey who was taken into police custody for breaking into a locker and stealing $220 from a woman's purse. Juvenile court proceedings were initiated on his behalf. He was adjudicated a delinquent and he was committed to a reform school for 18 months with the provision that the commitment could be extended until Willow's 18th birthday. The New Jersey juvenile court proceedings were civil, not criminal. Consequently, the standard of proof used in civil cases also applied. This standard is the preponderance of the evidence, which means a probability of guilt, not a certainty. In Willow's case, the judge acknowledged that he had some doubts as to his guilt. Nevertheless, he probably did the act and was deprived of his freedom for what could amount to six years. The standard of proof required in criminal cases has been proof beyond a reasonable doubt since 1798. In the Willows case, the U.S. Supreme Court wanted to preserve the civil and protective nature of juvenile court, but it also wanted to uphold a basic principle of American law, and that is innocent until proven guilty. The court held that the due process clause of the law and the 14th Amendment protects the accused against conviction except upon proof beyond a reasonable doubt of every fact necessary to constitute the crime with which he is charged. The Supreme Court mandated that the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt shall apply in any juvenile proceeding in which it is alleged that a juvenile committed an act that would be a crime if committed by an adult. Your Honor, both cases make equally clear that juveniles must be given due process. These are copies of case citations for reference, Your Honor. And so um, let me give you some words. You've got um, amendment is A-E-M-T, A-E-M-T. Uh, you've got reform, I think, R-F-R-M. Yes, R final FRM. Um, you have a constitution, tuition, T long U G S, but the asterisk, if it is capped. And then delinquent is delinquent, two strokes, D L I N quent, Q E N T. Okay? And we'll get ready for your mock, you all. And I will start with one minute at 180 for warm up, okay? Okay, this is gonna be then one minute at 180 for warm up, okay? Lift. Sometimes they can be talking to you like I am talking to you and make a great deal of sense. In the next sentence, you're bobbing and weaving and their eyes are glassy and they're rolling all over the place. You and I have experiences like that all through our life. There's no difference in this case. And that's what Dr. Rawls was talking about. How does alcoholism affect an individual's perception? And Mr. Freeman, it is the same thing. They're no different than Mr. Freeman. That's what Dr. Rawls had to say. So not only that, but even the prosecutor's witnesses supported that. Pat Moore, what did he say? He said that when there is evidence of physical impairment, the glassy eyes, the slurred speech, the stumbling, the staggering, when there is this type of evidence of physical impairment, we know that mental impairment is already present. 
the first thing that gets impaired is mental impairment. The mental processes and the thinking processes are impaired, okay? That is a given. We know that to be true from the... And then you've got on your 180 lit mock, uh, Mr. Freeman, proper names, Dr. Ira Rawls, Vordire, and that's written V final RD, uh, plethora, plethora, just two strokes, plethora. Mr. and Mrs. Smith and Marms is Mr. and Mrs. Mrs. And then just write Smith, okay? This is gonna be then 180 lit for five minutes for your mock and it starts in the middle, okay? Here we go. One eighty lit. If you had that awareness, if you are aware of the risk, if you are aware of the danger, then it would make sense. You would say to yourself, I don't want to put myself in that situation. I don't think anyone who or anyone would want to put themselves in that situation. When you think about it and you are aware of it, do you realize how dangerous it is? Did Mr. Freeman have that kind of clear thinking and that state of mind that you and I have and do have presently? And that is what I want you to do. I want you to try and put yourself in Mr. Freeman's shoes, at least, as to a state of mind at the time. <clears throat> All right, put yourself in his shoes. Try to understand his state of mind, ladies and gentlemen. I am not asking you to decide whether or not Mr. Freeman was right or wrong but I expect to some degree you are going to decide what he did was wrong. But what I am trying for you to decide is what kind of state of mind did Mr. Freeman have when he operated that motor vehicle on that day? Because I feel that the evidence has shown that his state of mind during that day was too unclear for him to be aware of that risk, the danger that was involved in him operating that motor vehicle. So there has to be this subjective awareness, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, of the risk involved. He had to be aware of it. In other words, what would the reasonable person be aware of at the time? Because that's negligence. What do we all believe that a reasonable man would be thinking at the time? That's negligence. That is the subjective standard. The subjective standard is implied malice. What he's thinking, okay? The other aspect of it is a conscious disregard for human life, a conscious disregard for that harm or that aspect of injury. Again, not an objective standard, but a subjective standard must be recognized. Did Mr. Freeman have a conscious idea of harm involved at the time? Did he have the ability to contemplate the potential harm to individuals on the highway? And I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, that there's plenty of evidence to indicate he was not. First of all, without question, Mr. Freeman, unfortunately, is an alcoholic. The prosecutor proved that as well as Dr. Ira Rawls, but the prosecutor proved it by all of these priors. Mr. Freeman has a history of alcoholism. He has a history of drinking and driving. He's gone to rehab and other related programs, supposedly, and it hasn't had any effect on him. That is a typical alcoholic, a typical alcoholic, ladies and gentlemen. I think some of you told us during the course of the board dire that you knew what alcoholism was. In some respects, some of you had experience with alcoholics in your background, and I would think that common sense would tell you, and from the evidence as it's been shown to you during the course of these last three or four weeks, that Mr. Freeman is an alcoholic and is suffering from alcoholism. I emphasize the fact that he's suffering from alcoholism because there's evidence shown by Dr. Ira Rawls that in fact, alcoholism is a disease, something that an individual really can't control. All right, that is alcoholism. It is a disease. There has been no controverted testimony otherwise. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you might not like it, okay? You might not like the idea that somebody is an alcoholic and drives a motor vehicle like that, but that's not what you're here to decide. You're not really here to pass moral judgment on Mr. Freeman. What you're here to decide is whether or not, and I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the most important question in this case is whether or not Mr. Freeman had that implied malice that day, whether or not he was subjectively aware of that risk, whether or not he was aware of the risk and to what degree, 
whether or not he had this conscious disregard for the harm involved and the life involved. Now, we have a plethora of testimony indicating that he didn't know what was going on. I mean, he is driving on the wrong side of the road just by the testimony of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. They said he was driving and weaving all over the road. He was going from one lane to the other. Other witnesses testified in a similar manner. And when I say he was drunk, I mean to say he was intoxicated. That is also an indicator that he doesn't have the ability to form this implied malice, to form this mental state that is necessary. Because there's another jury instruction that I think the court has already read to you. In fact, I'm sure he's read it to you. It's called voluntary intoxication. What it basically says is, you believe that Mr. Freeman was voluntarily, meaning he went and did it on his own accord, that he voluntarily got intoxicated and that intoxication affected his mental ability, so to speak, that you could take that into consideration as to whether or not Mr. Freeman can form. And then we have one minute at 200 jury charge warm up. And this is one minute, you all, 200. When I complete my instructions, the jury will go to the jury room to begin deciding this case. We call that the deliberation phase. The word deliberation suggests two important things. A group of people deliberate an issue when they sit around and talk about it. To act deliberately is to act carefully. Those two concepts are important and you need to know them. During the deliberation process, you will sit around a table, you will discuss the evidence, you will see how it adds up with the legal standards I have just described. Everyone should have a chance to speak their mind. Try to be willing to take a fresh look at your own ideas and your own points of view. Ladies and gentlemen, you may decide to change your point of view if you conclude that another one makes more sense to you and better fits the facts and the law. But don't just walk away from your own point of view. If you are convinced that your point of view is the correct one, according to the law and the evidence, stick to your guns. During your discussion of the evidence, do not consider yourselves as partisans. And then we have your 200 um, mock jury charge, proper names. It says none, you all. So no proper names, okay? This is going to be then your 200 jury charge for your mock for five minutes. And I do see court capitalized. So when you can replace judge in the sentence, capitalize court. This is going to be 200 jury charge for five minutes for your mock. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, now that you have heard all of the evidence and have heard the arguments of counsel, it now becomes my duty to give you the jury instructions of the court concerning the law which governs this case. It is your duty as jurors to follow that law as I shall state it to you. Apply that law to the facts as you find them from the evidence that has been presented in the courtroom. You are not to single out one certain instruction alone as stating the law. You must consider the instructions as a whole. Do not dissect one instruction and pit its meaning against another instruction. Neither are you to be concerned with the wisdom or intelligence of any rule of law that is stated by me. Regardless of any opinion you may have as to what the law is or ought to be, it would be a violation of your sworn duty to base a verdict upon any views of the law other than that given in the instructions rendered to you by the court. It would also be a violation of your sworn duty as the judges of the facts to base a verdict upon anything other than the evidence that has been presented during the trial proceedings. In deciding the facts of this case, you must not be swayed by bias or favor as to one side or the other. All parties should be treated equally, whether actual persons or companies or whatever. Our system of law does not permit jurors to be governed by prejudice or sympathy or public concern or public feeling. Both of the parties and the public expect that you will carefully and impartially consider all of the evidence in the case. We expect you to follow the laws stated by me in these instructions and come to a just verdict regardless of the consequences. It is your duty to determine the facts and in so doing you must consider only the evidence I have admitted in the case. The term evidence includes the sworn testimony of all the witnesses and the exhibits admitted by the court during the trial proceedings. Those exhibits will be provided to you for your review when you retire to deliberate. 
Remember that any statements, questions, objections, or arguments made by the lawyers are not considered as evidence in the case. Their opinions are not evidence either. While you should only consider the evidence in this case, you are permitted to draw such reasonable inferences from the testimony and the exhibits as you feel are justified in light of common experience. In other words, you may make deductions and reach conclusions which reason and common sense lead you to draw from the facts which have been established by the testimony and evidence in the case. But try not to speculate about possibilities that were not fairly proved in the courtroom. Now, I have said that you must consider all of the evidence. This does not mean that you must accept all of the evidence as true or accurate. You are the sole judges as to the credibility or believability of each witness. You are the sole judges as to the weight to be given to any testimony. You may accept or reject the testimony of any witness in whole or in part. I hope you understand what I mean by that. Some witnesses are permitted to give opinions because of their specialized training, education, and experience. For these witnesses, you might also weigh the reliability of any testimony or opinions. Consider whether the witness has enough training and background or experience with which to form the opinion in question. Do the facts necessarily support the opinion and have the facts actually been proved? Is one opinion better than the other? Does one opinion fit the facts which you conclude are true? Determine the facts and then work with them to determine a final verdict in the case. A witness may be discredited or impeached by contradictory evidence or by showing that he testified falsely concerning a material matter or by evidence that at one time or other the witness has said or done something or has failed to say or do something which is inconsistent with the witness's present testimony in court. If you believe that any witness has been so impeached, then it is your duty to give the testimony of that witness such credibility or weight as you may think it deserves. The party asserting a claim has the burden to prove that claim. The party asserting the claim must satisfy the legal requirements I will lay out for you. To satisfy this burden, he or she must persuade you that each of the legal requirements more than likely happened. It is not every fact which may have been discussed which must be proved to a probability, but the legal requirements must be proved. Your job is to decide the facts based on the evidence that you have heard and seen during the trial proceedings. The evidence includes the testimony of witnesses and the exhibits that have been admitted. You will be given the exhibits in the jury room. You may look over the exhibits, but the exhibits must not leave the courtroom. They are kept safely in the evidence locker when not in use. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, in deciding the facts, you must not be swayed by prejudice or sympathy toward any parties. My job is to give you the law. After you decide the facts, you need to apply the law that I give you, even if you do not agree with the law. Try to remember that statements, objections, and arguments made by the lawyers and by me are not evidence in the case. Each lawyer's job is to point out those things that are most significant in the case at hand. You also should not assume from... Okay, and we'll get ready for your one minute Q&A. And this is going to be one minute warm up to 25 Q&A before your mock. That contract was entered into October of 1969. I don't have a date on hand, but it was prior a prior contract to this one. And the one that we are discussing now is an addendum to that initial contract. It was a major change in the initial one. It was a change. On recommendation by Shelton Sheet Metal. It was a change from what to what? 12-foot machine to a 15-foot machine. From a machine that had a belt in it to one that only had a tender frame. There was quite a number of major changes in the machine. To whom did Shelton make this request? To Mr. Vassar. Mr. Vassar. Are you certain that it was made by Shelton to Mr. Vassar? I don't know exactly who made what, but it was between the two of them. 
and between Shelton and Vassar. Of course, the initial one. I guess that was a 12-foot machine, and we ended up with a 15-foot machine. Let me ask you this. Would you have been very satisfied to have received the first machine and have it in operation over there? 100%. So it is. Let's put it this way. We do not have tufting that goes to 15 feet, but we have a coder that goes to 15 feet. So the first machine, the contract before it, Okay, and on your 225 Q&A, you have Ms. Moore, Mary Wilson, Mary Moore, West Springdale Drive, Tampa, Security Services of Florida, Mrs. Wilson, Alfred King Jr., Central Avenue, King, Mrs. Mason, Alfred King, Mason, Alfred, Children at Play. And this will be 225 Q&A for your mock, and it starts in the very beginning, you all. Miss Moore, tell me your full name, please. My name has changed now. I have married since. It is Mary Wilson now. And it used to be what? Mary Moore. Where do you live at the present time? 3923 West Springdale Drive. Here in Tampa? Yes. Are you employed? Yes, I am. Who is your employer? Security Services of Florida. What do you do for them? I am a secretary. Mrs. Wilson, your name has been given to us as a possible witness to the accident that Alfred King Jr. was involved in. Are you familiar with that accident? Yes. Where were you located when it happened? I was going down Central Avenue behind the lady. You were driving the car that was behind the defendant's vehicle, the car that came in contact with the King boy. That's right. How far behind her were you? About a car length, I would say. Do you recall the speed of your car approximately? About 25. I couldn't get up to 30, and I was in a hurry that day. I remember that. You say you were in a hurry. Yes, I was. Do you know what the speed limit is there in that area? I don't know if it is 30 or 35. In your opinion, was Mrs. Mason, the defendant, exceeding the speed limit? No. Did you see the little child, Alfred King, leave the corner and walk into the street? No, I didn't. And I don't mean to suggest that he walked into the street either. He may have run. I don't know. In any event, did you see him leave the corner and somehow get into the street? No, I didn't. What was the first thing you saw that attracted your attention? When I first saw him, I thought he was falling out of the car, but he must have been coming over the hood at that time. That is the first thing you saw up ahead that indicated to you all was not right. That is correct. Did you ever see the tail lights of the Mason vehicle come on prior to the time you saw Alfred coming over the hood? About the same time, I guess. I looked up and I saw him and I saw her come to a stop and then I had to stop too. Everything happened about the same time? Yes. Other than you and Mrs. Mason, was there much traffic in the immediate area at the time? Would you characterize it as light, heavy, or medium? It was pretty heavy. We were traveling east and it was definitely heavy coming toward us. There was nothing ahead of her, I remember, but I couldn't get a chance to go around. What kind of an area was this near the scene of the accident? What do you mean? Well, was it a commercial area with stores and other businesses, establishments, or was it primarily residential? Oh, it was just houses and of course the local school and playground. Did you notice any children in that area at the time? Yes, there were quite a few kids around. Were they playing ball, riding bikes, running to, on the sidewalk? What were they doing, if you recall? Well, I saw some kids playing baseball in the playground. There is a baseball diamond there. Is that right near the corner where this accident happened? Yes, right on the corner, on the left-hand side. Is that the same corner that Alfred was standing on just before the accident occurred? Well, I don't know that at the time, but that is apparently where he was when he went into the street. When did you learn that, ma'am? When I spoke to Mrs. Mason after the accident, she told me he had darted out from that corner. I take it you had a conversation with the defendant following the accident, is that correct? Yes, I did. Not really much of a conversation, though. Can you tell us what was said? Well, I just got out of my car and went up to her car, and she was obviously very upset. She just said she never saw him until he dashed out into the street in front of her car and she couldn't stop in, in time. Was that the extent of the conversation? Just about, yes. Did you talk to anybody else at the scene after the accident? Yes. I talked to the patrolman who arrived on the scene shortly after the occurrence. Did the officer take a statement from you? Not a statement. He just asked me if I had seen the accident and I said yes and he took my name and address. Let me ask you this. Is this route one that you travel pretty often? Yes, sir. I take it quite frequently. My grandmother lives right around the corner, about half a block up, and I'm in the habit of visiting her pretty often. Now, I want to ask you about the conditions at the time of this accident. What was the weather like? Oh, it was a nice day, sunny. It wasn't raining and the roads weren't wet, is that right? Right. 
How about visibility? It was a clear day. Were there any traffic control signs on Central Avenue at that point on that day? Like a stop sign, you mean? Yes, or a traffic light. Were there any signs of any nature that you know of? No, I don't think so. I don't remember any. You testified previously, I believe, that there was a playground at that corner. Did you see any signs like children at play or anything like that? No, I didn't. I, and I am pretty sure there aren't any signals like that. As I say, I go by there pretty frequently and I would have noticed if there was a sign like that. Incidentally, do you happen to recall the date when this accident occurred? It was a Thursday afternoon. I know, about the 9th or 10th. June 9 or June 10, you mean? Right. About what time of the day? It must have been 3 or 3.30 by that time. You say you saw children playing in the area. Had they just gone, gotten out of school for the day or what? I suppose so. I think they let school out at 2.30 or 3. Do you know if young Alfred, the boy who was injured, was of school age? I understand he was six years old. Following this accident, have you been contacted by the defendant or by anyone on her behalf? No, I haven't. Have you given any statements in writing to anyone regarding the? Okay, so that's it, you all. Have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow with another mock, okay?